Welcome. We're so excited to share this presentation with you today. Uh, we have our friends at Amgen that are going to be participating on a fireside chat about biologic and biosimilar medicines. So I'd like to welcome you to this uh, very uh, interesting and uh, timely uh, topic and introduce our speakers. So we have Andrew Spiegel, who is the executive director of the Global Colon Cancer Association. We have Chad Pettit, who is the executive director of Global Value Access and Policy at Amgen. And we have Leah Crystal, who is the Executive Director of Global Regulatory and Research and Development Policy at Amgen. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us. And I'd like to turn it over to our Executive Director of the Global Colon Cancer Association, uh, Andrew Spiegel. Andrew? Thanks, Nicole. Well, thank you to our esteemed panelists for joining us today. And thank you to our audience for paying attention to this really important session on biosimilars. And this is something I, I have spoken about a number of times and actually really enjoy speaking about uh, biosimilars. And that's in large part because we have seen uh, quite an impact of biologic medicines that I'm going to discuss in a couple of seconds and uh, as well as biosimilar medicines. And we're gonna do our best to explain to the audience what these medicines are, how important they are uh, specifically how important they are to the colorectal cancer community. We're going to highlight a little bit of the work that we've done in the biosimilar policy arena around the globe. And we're going to then talk to our experts uh, about a lot of the policies that are in place and, and how important some of these policy considerations are for patients as uh, biosimilars make their way across markets around the world. So let's start off uh, with biosimilar 101, biologics 101, and I'll uh, say a caveat that I am a lay person. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a, a, a doctor. And so uh, my more than 10 years of experience in this policy arena, I think allow me to explain things in, in a way that lay people like me can understand. And so I'm going to take a crack at it first. And if I do something wrong, our esteemed experts will uh, absolutely correct me and they will uh, explain the proper way. So, so let's start off with, first of all, what is a biologic and what is a chemical? Drug. Let, let's look at these two classes of medicines. So a chemical drug, a pill. We all have taken pills, antibiotics. We've all taken aspirin. We've all taken chemical drugs our whole lives. And we know that these chemical drugs are simply made from a recipe. So if I have the recipe to make aspirin and I give you that recipe and you follow that recipe to a T of exactly how to make aspirin, you can make aspirin just as good as Bayer can make aspirin. And I mean that with no disrespect to our other conference sponsor, Bayer, because I think they would even agree that when it comes to chemical drugs, it's just simply following a recipe for the most part. And if you got the recipe and you follow the recipe, you can make that chemical drug just as well as any other company can make that chemical drug. And what that has led to over the years is this whole generics industry. So the originator that manufactured this chemical drug gets a certain period of time to recoup their investment and their research and development costs. And then other manufacturers get the opportunity to create generic drugs just by following that same recipe. And people over the years have certainly grown accustomed to taking generic drugs and they should be working exactly the same as the original drugs without any hesitations on the part of the vast majority of people. So, what about these biologic drugs? What's the difference? Why can't they be the same? Well, they can't be the same. And the reason is very simple. Chemical drugs are made from chemicals. If you pull those chemicals off the shelf and you, you whip them up, you make those chemicals just as good as the next guy. But with biologic drugs, they're not made from chemicals. They're made from living organisms, proteins, and, and all very technical things that I don't even understand but they're very highly complex medicines that are made from living organisms. So even if I give you that recipe to make my biologic drug, you can't make the identical biologic drug or what we consider to be generic drugs. And that's because you're not, even if, if you have the recipe, you don't have the original cell line that created those original drugs. And so, uh, while a manufacturer may give that recipe to a biologic drug to another manufacturer or that other manufacturer reverse engineers that drug to create their own uh, copy of that biologic drug, 
that biologic drug could never be the same as the original biologic drug. Now, that's not to mean it's not just as safe or just as effective as the original drug. And we're going to talk a lot about that today. But what it does mean is that you can never use the word generic on a biologic drug. You can never say, well, I'm taking the generic of that bio biologic drug, that original reference drug. And that's because, uh, as I said, you can't possibly duplicate that perfectly because you don't have that living organism so on. So I hope that kind of gives a, a, a layman's understanding of the difference between a chemical drug where you follow the recipe with the ingredients on the shelf and you make it the same versus a biologic drug, which you can't follow the recipe of because you're missing that main ingredient. And so we're going to talk about today some of the issues that that come to play with these biologic drugs. And so uh, while we don't have generics for biologic drugs, what we do have is a relatively new concept called, you guessed it, biosimilar. They're not identical, but they're similar enough to gain approval from regulatory bodies such as the FDA or the EMA or other regulatory bodies around because the data that's been presented to that regulator has has met the standard that's set out by that regulator to prove that that drug is just as safe and just as effective and that patients shouldn't worry about taking a biosimilar drug. And that's a part of what our experts are going to talk about today is the difference and whether patients should be concerned. So, why do we care about all this? What is the promise of these biological drugs? And why should colon cancer patients care about these biologic drugs? Well, uh, we saw more than a decade ago that colon cancer patients have to care about these biologic drugs. And the reason is uh, when I got involved in the policy arena more than 20 years ago, there were no biologic drugs for colorectal cancer. Uh, there was one drug that was out for a long time. It was highly ineffective. Fast forward now, we're somewhere around 15 approved drugs for colon cancer around the world, and more than half of those drugs are biologic drugs. And so what is the impact? What, are the, what is the impact of those biologic drugs to the colon cancer community? Well, since their introduction, we have seen the average life expectancy of the sickest of colon cancer patients, the most sick, more than triple. And we're talking about going from uh, almost a death sentence when my mom was diagnosed with colon cancer of, of only living seven or eight months. And we now see patients living years and years and years in large part due to these biologic drugs. And so the colon cancer community, uh, as much as any other disease community, uh, is highly invested in getting as many biological drugs to market and getting access to these biological drugs, as well as the newer biosimilar drugs that are coming out and are out now for colon cancer around the world. And so that's why we care about biologic drugs and biologics policy, and we care about biosimilar regulatory policies, and we have uh, for, uh, for over a decade, and the, the GCCA has been advocating uh, for almost a full decade uh, with regulators all around the world. And I'm proud to say that we have been on the forefront of developing biosimilar policies. Often, we've been the only patient group in the room that's been invited by regulators, in large part because we've been involved since the beginning. And uh, we've been invited to the World Health Organization in Geneva probably a half a dozen times over the last decade. We've testified in front of regulators uh, like the FDA, and, and uh, including Leah when she used to work for the FDA. I many times I saw her on the other side of the table uh, in testifying for patient rights for biologic and biosimilar policy. We've testified in Canada, in front of Health Canada, in Brazil, at, in Ibiza, South America, Asia, Australia, uh, all throughout Europe. We've truly been at the forefront of advocating for patient-centered policies for these biosimilar medicines. And those policies have been uh, on a number of issues over the year, from what should these, these medicines be called? Should they be called biologics or should they be called biosimilars or follow-on biologics? There's been many different names that they've been called over the years. How much data should a regulator require to approve a biosimilar and, and what kind of data should that be? What's the quality of the data? Uh, and what responsibility should manufacturers who are putting these, these uh, drugs out on the market have to track those drugs and to trace those drugs, and to do what's called pharmacovigilance, to make sure that once these drugs are out in the market that we're tracking them and we're making sure that they're just as safe and just as effective and, and tolerated by the patients. And so uh, what should be on the label 
so that healthcare providers know. So all of these sub issues have been issues that we've been advocating, uh, advocating for over the years to make sure that we accomplish our ultimate goal, which is that patient centered policies are put in place for the approval and the distribution of biosimilar medicines. It's very important that patients have an understanding, healthcare providers have an understanding of exactly what a patient is taking. And we thought getting involved in this issue early will help shape those policies to make sure that they're patient friendly, because it's a lot easier to help shape policy as those policies are being developed than to try to go back later and get regulators to redo policies that we don't consider patient friendly. So I'm really proud of the work that we've done over the years. And uh, we've had great success in a number of countries in making sure that regulators adopt patient friendly policies for these uh, very complex medicines, these, these, uh, these, these very large biologic medicines. And by the way, uh, these medicines aren't just helping colon cancer patients. And, and I know a lot of you have issues other than colon cancer, but I've been on many panels over the years with other healthcare providers where we've seen in the, in the rheumatology space, for example, I've heard uh, some experts talk about 20, 30 years ago when they would go to pediatric rheumatology conferences and they would see nothing but kids in wheelchairs and walkers. And now because of biologic drugs, they're all playing sports in school, living normal lives. And the same thing in Crohn's disease and colitis and in, um, in dermatological diseases and now in cancer. We now have a, a many biological drugs for cancer and biosimilar drugs that are coming to market. And so um, uh, we've got to make sure that patient friendly standards exist for the approval of biosimilars, for the tracking of biosimilars once they've hit market, and that we have to make sure that the information patients and physicians receive is accurate. Uh, there's a lot of anecdotal uh, stories going around the world about biologics and biosimilar medicines, and we want to make sure that the information uh, that people are receiving is accurate and up to date uh, so that physicians and patients know what the right medicine is for the right patient. And that's important because when you're talking about biologic drugs, um, it's not a one size fits all approach. Uh, and doing a one size fits all approach where you would put a whole class of people on a certain medicine will not work for an, for a lot of patients. And so it's always been our position at the GCCA that patients and healthcare providers should be in control of the decision making process, not the payers, um, not the regulators who should decide which individual patient gets which drug. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of these issues today with our experts. I won't take up much more of your time. But I do want to say that the promise of biosimilars is very important to the community. Why should you care about biosimilars? Well, there's a good chance you're going to take one someday, number one. And number two, the promise of biosimilars is that they will come in and have come into the market at cheaper prices than the original reference product. And that saves the healthcare systems money, which of course benefits all of us. But what we have seen around the world is where biosimilars have been introduced and in some places where costs have come down significantly, we have seen greater access for colon cancer patients, which, which means because healthcare costs have been reduced, greater numbers of people get access to medicines they would not have otherwise gotten access to. And that therein lies the promise of biosimilars. So they're important, they're coming, they're here. There's a lot more coming in the future. And at this point, I want to uh, introduce our panelists who are the real experts in this field. And first, we'll start with Chad. Uh, Chad, you are in access uh, for Amgen. Uh, and could you tell us a little bit about what your role is in that department? And tell us a little bit about Amgen and its commitment, because Amgen uh, is, is a, a little bit of a unique position. Amgen is, an, is a reference manufacturer, meaning it makes the original biologics uh, and has for, for decades. But now Amgen is making biosimilars, one of the largest biosimilar manufacturers, if not the largest in the world. So why don't you tell us a little bit about you and your role at Amgen? Thanks, Andrew. I, uh, I'm Chad Pettit. I lead our uh, global uh, value access and policy uh, at Amgen. Uh, I've worked in, uh, in the US, I've worked in Europe, and uh, now I work in a global role 
I was in Europe during the early days of the biosimilars there, and uh, I've been part of uh, Amgen's team to uh, prepare and launch our biosimilar portfolio. You know, if you step back and look at the, at the big picture, there's been uh, 26 biosimilar medicines that have been approved. Uh, there's 15 that are on the market, representing seven, seven um, reference products. It's an exciting time. And for Amgen, Amgen's been uh, discovering, developing, manufacturing biosimilar, or not biosimilar, biologic medicines uh, for 40 years now. And so this is just a natural extension uh, in terms of biologic medicine of what Amgen does. And uh, with our biosimilars programs, we have 10 uh, biosimilar programs now in our portfolio. Uh, we're investing heavily uh, in those medicines. We're, we've uh, invested about $200 million per program. So it's about 2 billion total. And uh, so we're, we're excited about this space. We're committed to it. Uh, we have four approved products in the US. We have two that are currently uh, on the market, um, uh, a biosimilar to Herceptin uh, and a biosimilar to Avastin, uh, which I know is, is of interest to this group. And you know, in terms of how we're approaching these medicines, uh, we treat biosimilars the same way that we treat every medicine that Amgen produces, the same uh, manufacturing standards, the same scientists, uh, the same reliable supply, the same uh, safety, which is especially important uh, right now in terms of supply uh, and, and safety with this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we have the same patient support programs so it's just, it's an exciting time to be in biosimilars. It's an exciting time to see uh, our first two medicines uh, really take off in the U.S. Uh, with the rest of the biosimilars market. Chad, when you mentioned 26 approvals, that was for the United States, but biosimilars uh, have been around much longer than they have been in the United States. And um, I believe the EU had about a 10-year head start. So could you tell us a little bit about uh, your experience with the EU and just the EU experience in general with biologics and, and now biosimilars. Yeah, if you look at um, if you look at Europe, uh, they had a pathway that was approved earlier, um, 2006. Uh, ours, the U.S. pathway is approved in 2010. Uh, it takes time to develop these medicines, and if you look at the timeline from when the biosimilars pathway is approved to uh, where we are now, and if you were to line up. The, the timelines were, were ahead actually in terms of approvals in the US, uh, 26 versus 18 at about the same point in time. And in terms of uptake uh, with, with biosimilars, uh, it's about the same place uh, as Europe was at the same point in time. And so what we're seeing is a US marketplace that is, is developing uh, at the same same level essentially uh, as Europe and uh, is, is really moving forward in the US. So, so Chad, I gave my, my layman's um, explanation of, uh, of a biologic drug versus a chemical drug. Um, maybe you could explain in your words what the difference is and how these, these drugs are different from chemical drugs. You know, I think I might defer to Leah on that since uh, she's the expert. I can certainly give an answer, but I, I'd hate to have the expert in the room miss out on that opportunity. All right. Well, let's jump to Leah then. I'll come back to you with more questions in a minute. But Leah, um, you and I uh, have met a number of times. Uh, most of those meetings have been where I have been behind a podium uh, testifying and screaming and hollering for patient-centered standards by the FDA. Uh, you worked at the FDA for many years, and you ran, I believe, the biosimilar development program, and, and you'll tell us all about that. But I remember uh, a number of times uh, you up on the, uh, on, the, on the panel of regulators from the FDA and uh, remember some very positive things coming out from the, uh, from the U.S. FDA in terms of ensuring uh, that biologics and biosimilar drugs are, um, are approved with very high safety standards with patient uh, patients in mind. So, Leah, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background uh, before coming to Amgen and now what you do at Amgen? 
Um, so I spent 16 and a half years at FDA um, prior to transitioning to Amgen. So um, my last, I think, nine years at the Food and Drug Administration, um, I stood up and ran the uh, biosimilars program for the Center for Drugs at FDA. Um, so from the time that we had our legislation in the U.S. that allowed the FDA to approve biosimilar products, I then helped the agency create that program um, within the FDA. So um, as, as you said, you know, FDA, I think, has always been very focused on ensuring a, a very scientifically sound program for biosimilars in the U.S. Um, there are learnings to be taken from the European Union, other areas of the world that had experience prior to FDA having their pathway, uh, the ability to approve biosimilars. And I think, you know, right out of the gate, uh, they wanted to ensure the, the scientifically appropriate regulatory standards. And, and as you said, really keeping patients in mind and ensuring the safety and efficacy of those products, just as they would any other biological product. So it is important, as, as you said, to understand biosimilars are biological products. Um, you know, people talk a lot about biologics and then biosimilars, but in fact, it's, it's kind of more accurate to talk about bio, biologics, including biosimilars. So, you know, biosimilars don't have a, a lesser standard. There's the same quality standard in the US and, and with other stringent regulatory authorities, the same quality standards for all biologics. So there's not a lesser standard for biosimilars. And that's really important for folks to know because that does go to the aspects of quality and safety of those products. Um, so when I made the choice to, to leave the FDA, it was important to me, um, you know, to continue to, um, be engaged in um, supporting those scientifically appropriate regulatory standards because I know how important they are. They're important not only to ensure the safety and efficacy of those products, but they're important important to patients and healthcare providers. You know to understand really the underpinnings of the approval uh, of those products and then to have confidence in those products, which then leads to uptake and use that then leads to that promise of biosimilars that you spoke about. So if a patient is being told that um, or asked to be put on a biosimilar instead of an original reference product, should they be concerned? I don't think that they should be concerned. No, you know, I, I think it's important to have a, an open conversation with their healthcare provider, their prescriber. As you said, there needs to be transparency. There needs to be, you know, an understanding of, of you know, what the patient is going to be on and for that healthcare provider to, you know, use evidence-based medicine to choose the product that's right for their patient, that's best for their patients and to have that dialogue. But those scientifically appropriate regulatory standards, again, in the U.S., what's in the statute, it refers to it that it's highly similar with no clinically meaningful differences. And at the end of that day, you know, it means that that product is safe and effective for what's referred to as the labeled conditions of use. So what it says it can be used for in the label when FDA approves it, FDA has found that it's safe and effective for that product use, just as they would any other product. And again, it's as safe and effective as the reference product. That's what the approval standards mean. And FDA will not approve a product, neither will the European Medicines Agency and other stringent regulatory authorities without knowing that that product is safe and effective. And, and what have we learned from the EMA? They've, they've had some more experience um, with biologics, uh, well, I'm sorry, with biosimilars. Uh, they had a little bit of a head start and more approvals before we even developed our pathway. And so what have we learned from them and how have those learnings been incorporated by other regulators around the world? So, um, you know, with the European Medicines Agency, they were one of the first um, what we refer to as stringent regulatory authorities to have a biosimilars pathway. Um, they had that in 2004 and then they had their first biosimilar product approval in 2006. Um, there are some differences in how regulators um, can approach uh, the, the biosimilars and, and what their scientific standards are, but FD, or, uh, EMA really kind of laid the groundwork for um, what would be a scientifically appropriate regulatory standard um, for biosimilars and really focusing on what data and information is needed to demonstrate biosimilarity, but also at the end of the day for them to make an assessment that that product is safe and effective 
um, for use in patients. And so I think as other regulators had pathways, they did look to what the EMA guidelines were. Um, the World Health uh, Organization also adopted um, the EMA framework. And so the World Health Organization um, is looked to, to um, create regulatory standards for emerging markets in a lot of cases. And so you'll see there those same types of scientific underpinnings that where we're trying to have consistency globally in terms of those scientifically appropriate regulatory standards. And I think EMA laid a lot of the groundwork there. Um, I think there's learnings that came out of that from the science as well over time about what data is necessary um, to support that approval. Um, and, and so, you know, they've thankfully shared that information. Um, you know, they're, they're fairly transparent about things. Um, and so I think other regulators have the opportunity then to look at those scientific learnings as well. So a number of times you've mentioned um, the importance of science-based standards. Um, could you explain, could you extrapolate a little bit more about why that's so important? Right, so, you know, again, these are biological products. And so that underpinning has to be from, again, a quality manufacturing standpoint that we're really, you know, making sure that we have quality standards for these products. And we also need to be looking at, it's, it's a different type of approval pathway. A biosimilar is comparing itself to a reference product. So they're demonstrating biosimilarity. So again, that highly similar with no clinically meaningful differences. So it's important from a scientific standpoint, including a clinical aspect, to understand what data is really necessary to show a comparison between those two products, the reference product and the proposed biosimilar product, to demonstrate biosimilarity. What needs to be compared about that? When we talk about analytical comparison, so, um, what we refer to as quality attributes and what's critical to then lead to a certain clinical function, how what the structure and function of that molecule is what we talk about, looking at exposure in the body, looking at uh, efficacy, so how the product is working and the clinical impact that it has. All of that knowledge and information and, and scientific assessment has to go into those standards. So it's, it's clear that the tests that are being done are evaluating similarity and evaluating it in the most appropriate and informative way so that when you're getting the, that data and it shows that the products are similar in some cases that they're not that that's a meaningful outcome that that can be interpreted that we understand that and that's what's so important about those scientifically appropriate standards is that when you're looking at what data is needed that you're doing the testing that's necessary to answer the questions about similarity and that's really important because otherwise you don't have that assessment for biosimilarity and you wouldn't have knowledge about the safety and efficacy of that product. And again, that's what's necessary to then give confidence to prescribers, to patients, and that you know, helps to support uptake and use. So uh, speaking about uptake and speaking about use and speaking about the World Health Organization, let me see if I can combine all of those in a uh, relatively recent meeting that uh, I attended um, with regulators from around the world at the WHO. Um, there was a call from some small regulators to loosen the standards for data approval uh, because they want biosimilars to get a boost to come to market to help lower healthcare costs. And they felt that the scientific standards that have been put out by the EMA and by the FDA and Health Canada and other regulatory, major regulatory bodies around the world were too stringent. And so what I would call those is uh, challenges, that there's challenges now to this um, science-based data-driven approval process that has been going on for now um, over a decade. What are, you, what are your thoughts about those challenges and lowering the data requirements for approval of biosimilars? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a, a really, um... Not great framing, especially when you're talking um, about patient health um, to ever talk about lowering regulatory standards. Um, I don't think it's good for regulators to have that conversation. I don't think it's, it's good for uh, industry to have that conversation. The concept of lowering standards is, is something that we should never be talking about. Um, you know, I think in the biosimilars pathway from a regulatory standpoint, there are areas to maybe think about building efficiencies in. 
So again, in thinking about the data that's necessary and really thinking about um, you know, how we can make that data collection, the clinical trial design efficient, that's the conversation that we should be having. I do think, however, that FDA, EMA, um, other stringent regulatory authorities, um, you know, in, in Japan, Canada, um, other places, and what's been adopted into the WHO standards includes flexibility for those types of efficiencies. And I think it's more of an issue of application of that flexibility, looking at individual products and what data is needed versus a, a wholesale um, change in those scientifically appropriate regulatory standards. Again, that science should always be applied and what's specific to and necessary for one product isn't necessarily right for another one. And, and that's the conversation that we should be having. And how timely uh, to be having that conversation about how important it is to follow the science during this global pandemic that we're experiencing right now, right? Um, but one of the things you just touched on was the need to build confidence among prescribers and among patients. Could you talk about what that means, the importance of that? And Chad, of course, I don't mean to exclude you if you wanna jump in. I know we've got our superstar here, but if, you know, feel free to jump in any time, Chad. Yeah, I, I can start from the, you know, uh, you know, education outreach aspect of things, um, but but I do think that there's aspects of confidence building that that are relevant in the, in the value and access conversation as well. So um, I can start, you know, and then kick things over to Chad. Um, but from my standpoint, again, we've talked about those scientifically appropriate regulatory standards. They can lead to confidence, which then can lead to acceptance and uptake and, and use of biosimilar products. But that only happens when people understand those scientifically appropriate regulatory standards and really how regulators are making their decisions, what that data package looks like. So that's where this concept of education and outreach comes in and in, in explaining to prescribers, explaining to patients what those standards are, how these products are evaluated, what is a biosimilar, what is a biologic. Again, as you said, there's sort of that layperson understanding. They're complicated products, you know, it, it's complicated science. Um, but it's incumbent on regulators, it's incumbent on uh, the, the pharmaceutical industry, it's incumbent on um, you know, prescriber, um, therapeutic organizations, patient organizations to all help support this effort to make sure that people are well educated. And without that information, everybody needs information like that to make an informed decision. It doesn't matter who you are and it really doesn't matter what the topic is. We just happen to be talking about biosimilars today. But that's really, really important that you're informed that you have a place where you can seek out information, that you have a trusted voice to find that information. And that's different for everyone. And that's why it's so important for all stakeholders to be involved with that education outreach and really talk about the science around these products and, and what those standards are. So that's, you know, for me from that regulatory side, so I can kick things over to Chad for his comments. And I would just agree with Leah, you know, if if I was a patient, I would just be asking some really simple questions. Uh, what What is a biosimilar? Is it is it safe and effective? Um, how are they manufactured? Uh, how are they approved? Uh, to me, if, if we can answer these basic questions, then I think as a patient, you can have the confidence that you need uh, to, to take a biosimilar. And, you know, it, it then creates the the opportunity to create to to establish competition in the marketplace and the and the promise of savings uh, to patients and to healthcare and to the healthcare system overall, which which uh, could potentially reduce premiums and create the broader benefit of allowing the system to then reinvest in new innovative medicine uh, to create the next generation of, of uh, medicines for patients. And Chad, you're in value access at Amgen and, and, and just what does that mean? And, and applying that uh, to the real world, how would, you, how would you answer those two questions you posed if you were answering it for a patient? Uh, what is a biosimilar and should I be concerned about taking it? Is it safe and effective? Uh, it's a, it's a great question. You know, I, I think 
for me, I, I would answer the question, you know, and I think we've, I think we've covered it quite well. Uh, it's a biologic medicine that's been uh, demonstrated uh, to be biosimilar to a reference product. And uh, because we have high regulatory standards, scientifically appropriate regulatory standards, uh, I can trust a biosimilar. And, uh, and so then in, in my role, it, my role is to work with the, the healthcare systems across the world uh, to then educate them on biosimilars and um, have them reimburse and pay for these products as part of their their healthcare systems, and uh, and so there's there's confidence that has to be had among uh, the healthcare systems, the the insurance companies, the physicians, uh, as well as patients, and uh, and so I think this this you know, we've talked about the importance of education. It's critical. People need to understand what are these medicines, uh, why are they important. And, uh, and, and can we trust them? And, and because you're in value and access, how would you describe the biosimilar rollout worldwide, uh, particularly EU and um, the US, because that's probably where you're most familiar, but just generally speaking, how do you feel the rollout has been on these relatively new medicines? Yeah, I think, you know, if I was to step back and kind of look at the big picture, I would say, it's it's sort of been uh, as as you would expect uh, with with a new medicine coming into the market uh, in both Europe and in the U.S. Uh, it took a little a little bit of time to sort of get the engine started, uh, but but once the once that's happened, uh, things have really taken off, and uh, we're seeing you know, Europe's ahead of the U.S. because they they had their pathway approved before the U.S pathway and, and uh, we're seeing broad biosimilar usage across uh, most countries in Europe. And, you know, I always caution people, uh, having, having lived and worked in Europe, my, my biggest learning was that Europe's not a country. That was, right. As an American, that was the, my biggest aha. It's actually many countries with many different healthcare systems and different populations of, of patients. And, uh, so I don't really look at Europe as Europe. I look at it as a lot of individual countries with individual healthcare systems, and we see differences across across um, the healthcare systems in Europe in terms of uh, how biosimilars are being used and what the uptake is. But overall, uh, we're seeing we're seeing them become an important part of of treatment and, and uh, creating uh, great savings there. And then in the U.S., uh, you know, we're seeing the same thing. It's just that the U.S. path was uh, a little bit um, slower to come to come in. But if if you if you look at from at the point at both systems started, we're at about the same place in the U.S. And uh, you know, we're seeing very good uptake. Uh, we're, we've got seven medicines. So let's see, fifteen approved to seven uh, reference products. And uh, in, in almost all of those, uh, the uptake's been very strong. And as some examples, the first biosimilar that came into the U.S. marketplace was a biosimilar to uh, Amgen's product, Neupogen. It's a short-acting uh, GCSF. And uh, the biosimilars now have over, um, well over 60% uh, market share in that, in that area. Uh, and we're seeing significant success with with our own products that we've just launched not even a year ago. It hasn't even been a full year yet. Uh, and we're seeing really good uptake. And so I think, you know, you've got to, you've got to connect all the pieces together. You have to have um, uh, regulatory standards that you can trust. You have to have uh, a level playing field and the ability for these products to compete because competition is what then creates sustainable uh, cost savings for the long term. Can you explain that concept a little bit? Because that's a really important concept. Yeah, I think you know. I think uh, in some countries and in in uh, some parts of the media, I think people have gotten confused and they've and and have been of the opinion that it's the biosimilar that brings the savings, which is actually not true. It's it's the competition that brings the cost savings. 
And there are some healthcare systems in, in some countries that have uh, forced patients to go to biosimilars, uh, which, which is not, not the right answer um, because it eliminates competition. And uh, you know, very often they do it to drive prices down to levels that aren't really even sustainable. And, and so if you think about it, if you, if you want a system where we have wonderful scientists who, who invent new innovative medicine, and then you give the manufacturer time to, to recoup their cost on that, the patents expire, competition comes in with biosimilars, you've got to have enough uh, incentive in the system for biosimilar manufacturers to invest. Uh, to develop biosimilars. These are not generic medicines, as you pointed out at the beginning, uh, where you could, you know, you could manufacture, you could invest two to five million dollars to in, in be a, a generic manufacturer, uh, as opposed to biosimilars are costing about two hundred million. And so you've got to, if if we want biosimilars for the long term on a sustainable basis, uh, not just for us but for our children's generation and beyond. Uh, and if we want this, this system to work in this kind of virtuous cycle of biosimilars then creating the savings that then allows for investment in innovative medicine, it's, it, you, you have to do it in a way that's sustainable. And, and competition is, is the way to find that right price point um, and that, that allows for uh, savings to the system allows for manufacturers to uh, invest in biosimilars, not just for the products that we have now, but you know, we're thinking 10 years ahead. We're thinking well into the future because these development programs take time. And so to invest in biosimilars for future medicines, uh, it, it's competition that does that. Right. So, so Leah, back to you for a moment. Um, when I think about I would say and have said to the question of how do we increase um, biosimilar usage and uptake? And I've always come at it from the patient advocate's viewpoint that it takes the combination of two things, data and transparency. Data to show that these biosimilars are just as safe and just as effective as the original reference product and transparency so that a patient knows what they're taking and knows why they're being prescribed a biosimilar and knows that there may be a potential cost savings because of that, um, hopefully to the patient as well, uh, because the patient is the last person that should have to pay more uh, to go on a biosimilar, but that's another issue for another day. But uh, data, transparency, I always felt would lead to uptake because of confidence. And if you could name two or three things that you feel would help patients and providers feel confident in taking a biosimilar. What would those suggestions be? Um, again, I, I think you know really the, the pivotal piece is, as you said, the the data and the understanding of that data, and you know finding ways to explain those scientifically appropriate regulatory standards. You know what what is the assessment that the regulator is making? What data are they seeing? What tests are, are being run? How are they making that assessment? I think that that's important for prescribers and for patients to understand um, when, when looking at a biosimilar and, and making an evaluation of whether that product is right for that patient. Um, without that information, again, there's, there's an inability to make an informed decision. So I, I think that that's a really critical aspect of, of understanding what a biosimilar is, but how it's approved and, and what, how regulators are making decisions. And, and again, at the end of the day, when a regulator approves that product, it's safe and effective, and it's as safe and effective as the reference product. 
Um, so, you know, that's a, a really critical piece for, for folks to understand. Um, you know, from the transparency aspect, I agree with you. You know, and FDA has taken the approach. Um, the European Medicines Agency has also taken the same approach in terms of in the, the product labeling, the prescribing information that a prescriber will see, it does identify that product as a biosimilar. So there is transparency that's there and it's important. And it's not intended to make people look at that and say, oh, there's something different. You know, there's something that I need to be aware of. It's not that because again, you know, these products are safe and effective um, or the agencies wouldn't approve them for use. Um, it's really about transparency um, and, and making sure that people have that information um, and that they're armed with that information and, and making those, those informed decisions. Um, so that is important um, and that is a tool that um, many regulators have made available to prescribers and that information is also available for patients to see. Um, the FDA also has a resource online that's called the Purple Book, um, and that does list all of the FDA approved biological products, including any biosimilar product, and it will note that the biosimilar um, or that the product is a biosimilar. If it is, um, there's information there about the product, um, and then also there's uh, links that will be on that, that web page um, to look at the labeling of that product and access other information about the product. Um, so there, there is that online resource that's for prescribers, for other healthcare providers like pharmacists, as well as patients. Um, so again, it's important for folks to know that that resource is there. Um, and then uh, FDA, as well as other stakeholders, do have education platforms. And a lot of information can be found um, on FDA's website. Um, it's www.fda.gov backslash biosimilars. They tried to make it as easy as possible to access that. There is a page um, specific for um, patients. Um, they've recently rolled out patient education information, but even the, the education information that's targeted to prescribers can be helpful. There's various different forms. There's one pagers, there's infographics, there's videos, there's other things that are there recognizing that, that folks receive information in different ways. Um, and then Amgen also has resources um, that we can share with you um, um, to be able to then share with your stakeholders. And what was that URL one more time? Uh, FDA's is www.fda.gov backslash biosimilars. Great. That's, um, that was going to be my next question, which you anticipated. And thank <laughs> you for answering that. Uh, it, uh, one other question did pop into my mind. I, I know we're running over, but um, uh, once you get me talking about biosimilars, I don't stop. <laughs> I'm so excited. Uh, I, I spoke really briefly about the concept of a robust pharmacovigilance system, and that's one of the things that we've advocated for over the last decade, is holding manufacturers accountable for the products that they put out on the market. And because these biosimilars are new, should patients feel comfortable that that these, these drugs are being tracked and traced and looking for any adverse events? And how are we doing overall with the, with the data that you've seen? Right. Um, so in those those stringent regulatory markets, again, biosimilars are biological products, and so they have the same requirements for pharmacovigilance as any other biological product. Um, so they are subject to the same reporting requirements, information gathering, um, you know, other regulatory aspects. In the U.S. in particular. Um, there is a, a, a unique product identifier that has been put into place to help support pharmacovigilance and that product tracking. So each um, drug product has what's called a, a brand name or a trade name that, that folks would be familiar with. You see it in advertisements. And then they also have something that's called a non-proprietary name. And that usually has to do with the active ingredient or in the case of, of biological products is referred to as a drug substance. So it's sort of that active component. In the U.S., there is a suffix that's attached to that um, that is unique for each product. And so when reporting adverse events um, or other aspects of pharmacovigilance that would include in, uh, prescribing, billing, coding, other aspects, um, that non-proprietary name should be included. Um, that's carried through all the systems that feed into pharmacovigilance to help with that product tracing. Outside the U.S., other regulators use different systems, um, but most recognize that it's important to have that unique 
product identifier, whether it's the brand name or some other um, identifier, and that that's used in every system from prescribing to billing to adverse event reporting that then all feeds into that pharmacovigilance system. Um, that leads then to if there ever is a problem, and sometimes problems do happen for whatever reason, it just can happen um, to any product. Um, but that way you can have targeted regulatory action. You're able to identify the product um, and that helps to ensure the uh, supply, the access um, to medicines for um, patients. Um, so you can have just a targeted action on one product versus a class of products. So that's why that product identification is so important for pharmacovigilance. It's something the World Health Organization has been working on for almost a decade now to try to get that policy to be universal called the uh, bio, biological qualifier proposal so that all around the world, we'd be able to track and trace these identical drugs, these biosimilar drugs and see how they're performing in, in the real world, right? Yes, yes. And again, this is important for every every drug. And so even patients can um, you know, be a part of that pharmacovigilance process. So it's very important to make sure that, that folks, if they're have adverse events and are reporting some sort of problem either to their doctor, their pharmacist, or even directly themselves, that they are including um, as much information as they can about the specific product to help make sure that we have good data. Um, and that's really important for everyone. Yep. Data, transparency, leads to uptake, right? That's our new mantra, data, <laughs> transparency, uptake, right? Uh, Leah, I can't thank you enough for taking time uh, during our uh, this, this crazy time in our world uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic. And thank you so much for bringing your uh, nearly two decades of experience um, uh, to, to our population to help explain the important differences between bio, uh, reference biologics and biosimilars and helping patients understand um, all that, that has been going on behind the scenes to make sure that these products are safe and that these products are effective for patients and that patients can feel confident if they're prescribed a biosimilar to know that the regulatory agency in their country has developed stringent requirements, high data requirements, uh, strong, robust pharmacovigilance systems to make sure that these products are safe, these products are effective, and that uh, Chad, as you said, um, and that these products are on a level playing field with multiple manufacturers, because as you say, Chad, uh, the more players that are manufacturing these biosimilar drugs, the more competition, and we know the more competition in any industry results in reduced prices. And uh, we hope that those re reduced prices, um, of course, trickle down to patients all over the world. So I want to again thank both of you for taking time out of your schedules, bringing all of this valuable information to our community. Um, if anyone has any final thoughts, please share them now. No, just to say thank you very much. And we're happy that, that we were able to engage with you, as you said, during this time of, of social distancing and other separation, that we're able to, to still work with you and, and to help support your stakeholder outreach. So we're, we're very happy that that's worked out and, and appreciate being able to work with you. Yeah, it's been a great discussion. Great, great. Well, thank you both. Well, Stay safe. And I turn it back to our champion, Nicole. Thanks, Andy. I just wanted to um, say thank you. Um, I've certainly learned a lot today. I want to uh, let our viewers know that if you have any questions, you can reach out to us at info at globalcca.org, or you can reach out to us on social media. Uh, our handle on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram is globalcrc. So that's at globalcrc. And we are happy to um, find out the answers to the questions. If, if we don't know them, um, we will follow up with, uh, with Leah and Chad on any specific questions that you have, and we'll be posting them uh, to our website. Certainly learned a lot and hope you have as well. Thanks so much and uh, appreciate you joining us.